Welcome back, Kellyanne. Thank you. Kellyanne has been here a couple of times before, both here and in Laguna Niguel. Both here and in Laguna Niguel. Yes, so welcome back. Um, little did we imagine 10 years ago that we'd be talking to you in this context. So, counselor to the president, what have you learned is the best way to counsel President Trump? The best way to counsel President Trump is to be very honest and to very humbly but candidly offer my perspective and my advice, which has always been welcome. Um, from the moment that Donald Trump hired me to be the campaign manager, we were alone in the 26th floor. We had just um, finished a couple of meetings, and he was on his way to Altoona in Erie, Pennsylvania later that day, that morning. And we had a discussion, and he offered, we had a very candid discussion. I s said, we're losing. I've seen the polls. We're losing. If the election is about you, we have less of a chance of winning. If the election is about Hillary Clinton, you will win. And how to turn that around. Um, and so I offer that advice very candidly, but very respectfully. I find that in employment situations, it's very important to assert yourself, but to also show a level of respect for hierarchy where it exists and for the classic employer-employee relationship. So I never, the last thing I said to Donald Trump, Mr. Trump, when he hired me as campaign manager was, I said, I want to say one last thing. I, will, I don't address you by your first name, and I don't consider myself your peer. That, and he said, OK. That allowed me to deliver tough news when I had to on the campaign trail, and certainly um, what I would consider to be tough news in the White House as well. So, uh, but he is just somebody who's always surrounded himself with female employees and has elevated them to the highest levels of the Trump Corporation. Took a, took a chance on women in New York real estate when many men who were dominating the industry would not. And he does the same thing in the West Wing. Tell, uh, give us an example of you counseling the president well in the White House as president recently. I can't share a lot of the pr private conversations, obviously, but anything that's you know more public, I would give. My, I'd give you a great example um, because I'm very involved in the opioid issue in the West Wing. Obviously, and yesterday was in West Virginia with our first lady Melania Trump, where we visited a really remarkable place called Lily's Place, um, one of the only uh, places of its kind in the country where they're helping the um, newborns that are born physically dependent on opioids. And it's obviously very sad, but to really raise the profile and help is a great deal. But we've been discussing, I've been um, speaking with the president very candidly about drug demand reduction, but also drug supply reduction. That you see we, in many of our communities, we actually have a fentanyl problem where these teenagers and college students are dying like that because they're buying a pill for $5, really for the cost of a latte. These kids who won't put a french fry or a piece of bread in their mouth are buying a pill for $5. And I want them to hear me and to say, please don't do that. You don't know what's in it. And so having a candid conversation about perhaps how we can as a nation um, raise what did awareness, you say but also to the president? Pressure. Well, I can't tell you that, but I well, think you're going to see some real policy. Well, you're bringing up this example. But what, um, I, uh, give us an example of your influence in this situation. My influence in this situation is I think that we have to be very aware that most of the fentanyl is coming in from China and that we've got a great relationship now with President Xi, a much stronger relationship than has been in the past due in large part to this president and his team. And uh, we've got beef and dairy going to China, for example, for the first time in I think 14 or 15 years in this country. And so if we're looking at cracking down on not having fentanyl come into our communities and literally poisoning and killing, um, our youth and others, then we have to have a very candid conversation with those who are supplying it. Um, so, so there's that. I've been involved in everything from tax reform to health care reform to a number of different issues. And also, you know, I'm a pollster by trade. That's why I was invited, I think, previously to your, to your panels. I owned a company called The Polling Company and Woman Trend. And uh, I'm very candid about the polling data, but also, just as I was during the campaign, I try to show the president, as I did the candidate, different aspects of the country situationally and attitudinally that I think is often missed in the polling data. What is your, to the extent that you can share with us um, the way you counsel the president, how do you talk with him about his tweeting? 
<laughs> it depends on the it depends on the treats. First of all, I think he still has his natural connective tissue with people, and uh, now more than ever, the ability to go around uh, some folks who don't cover a lot of what is good for this country. We've refused to cover the fact that the stock market is up 25%. It's had 44 record highs last count, maybe even more now, that he is trying to pass a middle class tax cut so that you can give this country a pay raise. Uh, we're trying to connect the six million unfilled jobs with the six million people looking for work. We're trying to put them together. Um, the idea that he wants to reform health care for the 29 million or so And he can so tweet Americans. about all those things. But he does. Nobody great. covers it. He tweeted about that this morning, actually, and I bet it hasn't been covered. We've done a content analysis where, uh, if, I think in June I asked for a content analysis. There were 180 presidential tweets, and most of them were about policy or events or statements or executive orders or pieces of legislation or trying to push the vote on something one way or the other. But that gets far less coverage than some of the others. Are you not concerned that his tweeting is adding to um, division and um, rancor? What I'm concerned about is that this president, and I hear this from people who did not vote for him, and from people who, um, people who don't always cover him fully and fairly either, but there is a concern that they literally have never seen a president covered this way. The words that are used to describe the, and I'm, I'm the person in the West Wing who's actually never uttered the words fake news, enemy of the people, opposition party. I don't speak that way. I think we need a full and free press in our nation, of course, uh, in a full democracy. But with, with that freedom comes responsibility. So my grievance is never, um, about fake news, my I, I talk about incomplete coverage. I talk about You've us not connecting. You've never used the term fake news, except in this conversation. And I understand, in the context of talking about the topic of fake news, you have never said. I don't speak that way. What I talk is about is incomplete coverage, because I think that we are in a position. Everyone in this room is in a position to connect America, and particularly America's women, with the information they need. So if you don't know the six or seven major measures that the president has put into law in his short time in office that have improved the lives of our veterans, the VA Choice Act, that where veterans who cannot access quality and timely care through the VA, which most veterans say they can, have the opportunity to go to private care now and do that, the Whistleblower Protection Act, the 24-7 hotline at the White House for veterans that was never had before where they can call and access information, access services. So if you've heard about that for the first time today, it means that that's incomplete coverage. The, the, the many different- Do you counsel the president in terms of his use of that term, fake news? The president is trying to improve the lives of Americans, he made a lot of sacrifices to be there. And he's got real news going on every day that doesn't get covered. But look, I think the best attribute I bring to my job is humility because I don't know how you can function in, in jobs like this um, without it. There's a certain grace and humility that is expected, I believe, in positions like this, that with the gravity and responsibility comes a certain humility. So I walk through the doors of the White House every single day, having been raised by a single mom without money growing up. I never knew that, because nobody they never talked to kids about adult problems. And I am very, very, feel very beholden to the forgotten men and forgotten women who helped elect this president, who feel like he is giving voice and visibility. And if I can be one small molecule in pushing that forward, then I'm going to make the family sacrifices and the money sacrifices that we made to do that. Who has questions? Uh, OK, uh, is there a question back here? Yes. Yeah, Michal Avram with Fortune. Um, you and President Trump have repeatedly talked about immigrants as criminals. And yet statistics show that um, immigrants, both documented and undocumented, are less likely to commit crimes than people born here in this country. You've also talked about them in the context of taking jobs from people who are born here. And I'd like to point out that the most entrepreneurial demographic is foreign born. So can you please explain what good the restrictions that you're proposing on immigration the anti-immigration uh, rhetoric that you've put forward does other than foment division in our country? Right. So there's an 
that's your perspective. And the fact is the president just put forward a 70-point immigration plan. I would commend everybody to look at it. It's very transparent for everyone to see. We're very happy that Leader Schumer and Leader Pelosi at least came to the White House and said that they're willing to talk about immigration reform. That includes DACA, and it goes way beyond that. The fact is that there are many Americans who are out of work who are looking, to, looking for jobs. And this, this president has made a commitment to make sure that the law is enforced. This president, in his immigration reform plan, is talking about 1,000 more ICE agents at the border because we hear from those at the border that they simply don't have the resources to meet the demand at the border. We want to make sure that the unaccompanied minors are, are cared for and are returned safely to their home countries. We want to make sure that the 300 new immigration judges that the president has in his plan um, come forward because they too tell us there's such a backlog in cases that they can't keep up. It's, it's not a lot to expect people to obey the laws. You talk about, this president's talked about sanctuary cities. He is basically saying if you want a grant, a federal grant, if you want money from Department of Homeland Security or Department of Justice, you must comply with the federal laws. And many, state, many cities, and now the entire state of California has said no to that. So they risk losing those grants for the rest of their citizenry as well. But I find it very elitist and arrogant when people say, and plenty of Republicans and Democrats have said the following, that illegal immigrants are here to do the jobs Americans don't want to do. That's really fair when I personally know people that are looking for jobs and are willing to do jobs, but they can't take $6 under the table an hour. They can't do that. And they, they, they want high paying jobs. We also want to make sure that American employers um, are being held to account. So E-Verify is, is in the 70 point plan. Again, you can read it. Uh, it's in the 70 point plan as well. So uh, we, I think casting it that way is not having a very meaningful conversation about the gaps in the system. Nobody can deny that, nobody can deny that in some cases, uh, folks who have been deported and committed crimes many times, like Kate Steinle's murder, she should be a household name, and nobody wants to make her that. I've met face-to-face, -face, shoulder to shoulder, with the parents of children who were killed, or in some cases murdered, by those who had been deported and those had been, who should not have been here and who had committed crimes. That's not everybody, that's not most of them. But to deny that is to deny the grief of those, of those families, and it's to not deny us coming together to have a better system. The, the idea that we have 30,000 unaccompanied minors here and everybody is okay with that doesn't seem right. I wanna ask another question about immigration. As a pollster, uh, many people say that you laid the groundwork, you provided sort of the intellectual infrastructure for the immigration thinking um, that led to um, both led to the election of President Trump and has served to fracture the Republican Party. Do you agree with that, that you significantly laid the groundwork? The Republican Party is fractured. I don't know. They've won 1,000 elected offices uh, for the eight years President Obama was there. Well, there's Excuse a lot me, of disagreement. Well, that's a fact. There. 938 state legislative seats, control the House, control the Senate, and indeed the White House. Yes. Uh, so that's, that's unignorable, okay. and it should be stated. So I'm not sure the Republican Party is fractured. I okay. think the Democratic Party is bereft of any new messages, which is why There's a lot struggling. of disagreement. Okay, the disagreement within uh, the Republican Party well, about the future of the party, do you feel that you re contributed to that as a pollster? Maybe it's an okay thing. I'm very happy to have tapped, to have recognized what people were thinking about this issue. You know, Donald Trump took the issues of immigration and trade, which immigration was probably at 3% in the polls, most important issue. Trade wasn't even asked in most polls. It was an asterisk, if you will, less than 1%. He took these issues that weren't popping in the polls, and he, put the, he talked about them in terms of fairness. He talked about, yes, we want trade deals, but they should stop screwing America. They should be more fair to us and our workers and our employers who are being punished for employing people here. They're being punished for trying to bring those profits back to this country. They're being incentivized to ship the wealth and the jobs overseas, which is why his tax plan would repatriate, deem repatriation, 
of 10% and then repatriate some of that $2.8 trillion that's legally parked overseas. And so he talked about it through the lens of fairness. He talked about it through the lens of how we want to make sure we're also protecting the American worker, American communities, American jobs. And in that way, we, we tapped into the fact that many Americans saw immigration as an economic issue and as an issue of fairness to them. And yes, and that got Donald Trump, Donald J. Trump elected. I think and he got himself elected. I get well, a lot of and credit, and I immediately share it. And and you, we had a great You team, helped a him in a big team. way, Kellyanne. Do you worry? Do you worry about the let's let's leave out the word fracture? Do you worry about the division in the Republican Party? And do you worry that it will provide? Uh, an opportunity for the Democrats in 2018. So I don't do politics in the White House. I certainly, you know, we don't do, we can't do, I can't talk about races, et cetera. So to the extent I could talk about a party, I'll talk about both of them, to be fair. Even though you didn't ask about the um, Democratic Party and its fracturing. I don't, I don't even know who the leader of the Democratic Party is. Is it Tom Perez, who's the leader of the DNC? Is it Bernie Sanders, who seems to get a lot of support? Um, won 13 million voters in 22 primaries against Hillary Clinton. Is it Hillary Clinton who's still out there talking? Is it President Obama? Is I don't know who the leader of the Democratic Party is. Is it Elizabeth Warren? Is it all the people already running in 2020 who really haven't done much in 2017? So in terms of the Republican Party, I'm glad that that party welcomes a diversity of viewpoints on any number of issues. You call it fracturing it. Fracturing, they, they refer to it as welcoming a diversity of viewpoints on any number of issues. So we have, um, of our, say, the, say the Republican female senators, for example, there are many more Democratic female senator, senators, but they all have one view on a fracturing issue like abortion. In the, the Republican female senators, we have pro-lifers and, pro, and pro-choicers. Mm -hmm. That's a party that welcomes different points of view on any hot button issues of the day, like abortion or immigration or tax reform. And I frankly think that's why they become the majority party. It's why they have a majority of the governorships and the state legislative chambers, and now the House, Senate, and yes, the White House. Because at least you feel that your, your, your different viewpoints are welcome and reflected in the party. But we, you know, we also, yes, sure. Another question. Okay, back here, we have a question. Uh -huh. Hi, I'm Moj Madera from BeautyCon Media. I just have two questions. Um, can I get your thoughts on the Charlottesville many fine people on both sides comment? I'm curious to know what you think of that. And then I'm also super curious to know uh, Robert Mercer, Cambridge Analytica, uh, their involvement in Brexit, and uh, of course I'm sure you're familiar with what they did here. Curious to know what you think of that investigation and what the American public should know about that. What investigation? About Russia. About Cambridge Analytica, about Robert Mercer, about bots, about fake news, about all the fake accounts? It's a very big question. Well, I'm sorry, what? Take, take the first one. I have a minute. Um, <laughs> in terms, well, I'm not, well, not going to let her besmirch you know, a private citizen. Uh, lots of people are under investigation, like Bob Menendez, a sitting Democratic senator in New Jersey. Nobody wants to cover it. He's a criminal defendant in a felony trial. But Bob Mercer and Cambridge Analytica, I'd love to know what you what what involvement do they have with your campaign so data, and Brexit oh, and everything else, the on and retargeting on. of Project Alamo and all the things that we're currently about. So I can talk about. about I can talk about the value of data in our campaign through Cambridge Analytica. Brad Parscale was our digital director, and he was on 60 Minutes this past Sunday, and I think treated the country to something they may not have known, which is at the Trump campaign, we did 50% TV ads and 50% online ads. It was a big risk that was taken, and people were really surprised that the Trump campaign was a bigger Google customer and Facebook customer some weeks than the Hillary Clinton campaign because she obviously had so much more money and a lot more personnel. And the reason that we did that was um, we saw a shift in the, in, the in the electorate, and we looked at them as consumers. How are they getting their information? So if you're, already, if you're already relying upon social media, or you're already relying upon direct text, me text messaging to receive and convey information, then why not apply that plumbing to your political information? And it turns out that that was a gamble that paid off because um, that is where people 
we're digesting a great deal of information. The traditional TV ad is important, but not as important. So in that regard, and I know Bob Mercer very well, and he's a great patriot, and he's a very humble person who invests in causes in which he believes. Um, uh, he's just been much more successful at it than others. I'm not aware of, of the other things that you're talking about um, in terms of investigation, but I do think that data like that is the way of the future. Kellyanne, what is power? I'm just glad you asked because I've, I've, talked, I've thought about that for a very long time. Uh, I believe that women in power particularly have a certain responsibility to define it and to harness it for the greater good. And I do try to do that every day. I don't necessarily feel powerful, but I do feel empowered um, to help make change. I was, I mean, power for me means that I'm a product of my choices, not a victim of my circumstances. It means that I am become very impervious to the naysayers and critics. And, and I think that's important. It also means that I am trying to really navigate the, uh, like millions of American women are trying to navigate the equilibrium between raising four school-age children and having um, a very busy job and the responsibilities on my, sh my shoulders that I do. But I, feel, I don't feel burdened at all. I feel blessed. And I feel like if we look at power as the ability to effectuate change and to make our own choices, um, then I'm comfortable with that. But I feel that I, I feel that there are so many women in this country that don't have the blessings that I have and the privileges I have that don't, that haven't been given their shot, that have worked just as hard as I've worked, but never really get that shot. When I went on Rachel Maddow's show a year ago, and she just won the Emmy for that interview, I'm very happy for her, uh, that she, I said, you know, she said, well, congratulations. And I said, you know, Rachel, I used to watch you as a panelist on Tucker Carlson. You had a show on MSNBC years ago. And I used to say, she's very smart, she's very intuitive, she always has something fresh and new to say, even when I don't agree with it. And I said, the difference between you and me is, we got our shot. There are a lot of talented, intelligent women who work incredibly hard, but they don't get that opportunity. And so, if I can be in any position to do that, if I, at the end of my tenure at the White House, can say fewer people are dying of opioid overdoses, or more military spouses, which are 92% female and predominantly are raising children, so they're effectively single moms when he's over de being deployed. If more of them can be connected with employment because they're underemployed and unemployed compared to the civilians in their different industries, if more Americans have health insurance, if people are, if entrepreneurs are, feel more comfortable to build a business like I did out of nothing, then I will feel like that work was done and I don't think power, I, th I think we're all free to criticize e each other's choices and how we look and how we speak, but I don't find that very empowering to other women. And so I'm trying to teach my daughters who had to grow up super fast because of the way their mother is sometimes treated, that that's not power. That's not exercising power. I think respectful disagreement is the best way that I can exercise that power, humbly but forcefully. And I just remember what Margaret Thatcher said. She has a famous phrase, being powerful is like being a lady. If you have to say you are, then you probably are not. So there's something to quiet power. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you very much.